Bible church. When the Son of Man returns to the earth, you know, Jesus, will he find faith? Yes. Only you can answer that. Thank you. I got two of you. You'll find it right here. Amen? Hallelujah. Bible. Basic instructions before leaving earth. The B-I-B-L-E. That's the book for me. You remember that song? Yeah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says that the word of God is inspired by God. Amen. And it's good for reproof and for correction, instruction and righteousness, so that the man and woman of God will be complete. One translation says mature. Another translation says perfect, which simply means mature. <laughs> Amen. In other words, God is interested in us growing up. Amen. And we've said this to you before, but it does bear repeating that, you know, if you had a 20-year-old in the nursery still working a bottle, you would say there's something wrong with the movie, wouldn't you? Amen? So it would seem that God is interested in three things, fundamentally or overarching or overall, right? Three core principles, the drivers of God, if you will, because we know God is love. And so all these three things are driven then by love. Number one, that everyone gets born again. Everybody on the planet gets saved. What do I mean by that? That everyone on the planet accepts that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Amen. 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 Number two, that everyone on the planet, after getting born again, gets filled with the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Why? Well, number one, it builds up your most precious faith, talking in tongues, speaking in tongues, amen. Number two, it prays out the plans, the purposes, and the mysteries of God here in the earth. And how many of you know he wants those to come to pass? But then number three, God is very interested in us growing up, spiritually speaking. We shouldn't be babies for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, amen. We should be growing in the things of God. What does that mean? Well, when you come into the kingdom of God, and none of this is in my notes, so you might want to lean in and pay attention, right? <laughs> when we come into the kingdom of God, depending on how long it's been since you've been on the earth, it could be 10 years, 20 years, in my case, 30 years before I came into the kingdom of God, your flesh has been running the show. Your best thinking has been the course and the direction of your life. And if you found, like me, that your best thinking and your best drinking, I mean your best thinking, <laughs> right, is causing you to get into accident after accident, causing destru destruction after destruction, then you might want to stop thinking for yourself. Amen. And if you're going to start drinking, then drink in the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Get into his presence. Allow him to fill you with the knowledge of God. Allow him to fill you with the peace of God. Right? There's tremendous levels of anxiety out there in the world today. But I submit to you, dear Christian, that the levels of anxiety have not changed since the garden. We just think it's worse because there's ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox News, New York Times, Washington Post, New York Post, whatever, Daily News, whatever, pumping it at you 24 hours a day, seven days a week, that it... Not only should you be afraid, but it's somebody else's fault. And so if you blame them, it'll make your fear go away. Well, when you come into the kingdom of God, that is no longer the case now, is it? Because we're children of God now. We've been translated out of darkness and into the kingdom of light. So immediately we should be happy. Are you happy this morning? Amen. Okay, I got three head nods. Okay, good. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Are you happy this morning? Right? Your happiness, by the way, is not based upon how you're feeling. Your happiness is not based upon what's going on in the political spectrum, in the civic spectrum, on the job, in your marriage, how your kids are performing, or if the dog has come and licked your face this morning, it's going to be a good day. Right? The joy that is found in a Christian, the peace that is found in a Christian, the happiness that is found in a Christian is found in the fact that God loves us unconditionally. Thank you, my Lord. Amen? Amen? And loves you so much 
with a white, hot, fervent, eternal, infinite love. That that love will chase you all the days of your life. Surely, goodness and mercy, follow me all the days of my life. Are you listening to me? The psalmist David wrote, even if I made my bed in hell, your presence will be there with me. Are you listening? Hallelujah. So, welcome to Faith Bible Church. We're glad you came this morning. And we welcome all of you out there in the social media platforms. Thank you for coming and joining in and listening. Um, it has been told to me by my team that last week there was a thousand of you that were listening in, watching and viewing. And so, welcome, and we so appreciate you. And they're telling me that if you'll type in where you're watching from, it'll help us. I don't know exactly what that does, but just give us a shout out. We know that we're uh, getting viewership in Australia and Pakistan and Kenya. We, we actually doubled our viewership in Kenya. Ha hallelujah, I think we've gone from two to four. <laughs> That's double. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Uh, but also, like we're going to encourage you fine folks, get out your Bible. Right? Let your eyes rest upon the Word of God. Do the work necessary to be a success. Someone say it out loud. I am willing to do the work necessary to be a success. In this case, it's looking at your Bible. Right? In this case, it's actually turning those pages. Oh, it's such agony. Right, And I know some of you use electronic devices, and I'm okay with that, especially uh, for novices, if you will, those that have just come into the kingdom. It's easier to go to BibleGateway.com and type in the scripture and have it pop up than to try to physically find it. Uh, but I'm going to encourage you to get a Bible. Amen. Amen. And begin to do the hunt, as I call it. Do the search. Dig in there. The scriptures say that finding his wisdom is better than rubies. Gold and silver. Amen. Amen. So you can have all the wealth of the earth. But if you don't have wisdom, you've got nothing. You're not hearing me this morning. If we don't have wisdom, you say, well, pastor, what's wisdom? I'm glad you asked. Wisdom is applying God's word to a natural circumstance. That's wisdom. Amen. The Bible teaches us that wisdom, the beginning of wisdom, is fear of the Lord. And I've heard a lot of preachers try to get around that word fear, right? And it is very, very simple. The word fear translated there is reverential awe. What does that mean? We're to respect God. We're to reverence God. Amen? When God's presence shows up here like it has this morning, we're to be reverent in that presence because he's here. He's here to meet you at your point of need. He's here to meet you at your point of need. If you're watching us, it's not by accident. God has a specific plan for your life. Help me preach this morning, church. God has a specific plan for your life. And according to Jeremiah 29 and 11, it's a good plan. It's a plan with a hope and a future. It's a plan to give you a certain end. Right? And how valuable is that level of peace in your life? That you know that God has a good plan for your life. Amen. Amen. That it is a plan with a hope and a future. Not doom, gloom, and destruction. Not going down in flames. Watch this. Come on. Hallelujah. A plan that gives you a certain end. You know exactly where you're going to end up. Hallelujah. And so we started this series a few weeks back called Faith Works by Love. There it is up there. Hallelujah. Faith Works by Love. And in our camp, you know, the charismatic camp, the word of faith camp, Pentecostal camp, whatever you want to label it, amen, we do believe that you must be in the word of God. That the word of God is the final authority. Right? Right? Uh, uh, Isaiah writes like this and Peter ends up quoting him the grass and the flowers they fade right but the word of God stands forever Isaiah writes this he says forever O Lord is your word exalted you've exalted your word even above your name so we 
as Christians, should place a premium on the Word of God. It should be the benchmark of our life, right? As a born-again Christian, what do you base your decisions on? How, how is your worldview shaped? I have a biblical worldview. When I see what's going on in the earth, I take what I have learned from the scriptures and it becomes my worldview. You don't have to go too far to know what's evil and what's not evil. Amen. You don't have to go too far to know what's deception and lies. Amen. We were teaching on Friday night that the way they used to train bank tellers was they were never handling counterfeit money. Ever. They only ever handled real money. So that when they were counting money, somebody came and said, you know, I'd like to exchange, you know, these $50 bills for $100 bills. If they were counterfeit, just by the touch, they would know immediately there's something wrong with that bill. It is the same for a Christian when it comes to the Word of God. If you handle the truth enough, if you read the truth enough, if you ingest the truth enough, you begin to see what's lies, what's counterfeit, what's false. Amen. Even if it's packaged really neatly and cleanly, and are you following me in this? And so uh, we really do believe, as a group of people, as born-again Christians, we really believe that you should get into the Word of God. And the Bible teaches us that faith comes. How does faith come? It comes by hearing, and by hearing the Word of God. So how is faith formed in a believer? You hear the Word of God. You read the Word of God, and it forms a belief in you. That if you allow that belief to govern what you're thinking, what you're saying, and what you're doing, you will have success no matter what. Are you listening to me this morning? Amen. Living proof right here that if you'll listen to the Word of God and allow the Word of God to form a belief in you and allow that belief to govern what you think, what you say, and what you do, you will have success yes. every single time. Amen? Amen? But in our camp, sometimes, not in here at Faith Bible Church, hallelujah, we overlook this very important aspect that faith works. Somebody say faith works, it works. by love. Right. right? So if you're missing the love ingredient, will your faith work? You could be a tremendous person of faith and power. You could read the scriptures and say, oh yeah, that's the truth and I believe it. And I am allowing it to govern what I'm thinking, what I'm saying, what I'm doing. But if your faith isn't working, then the first thing that you and I must check as born again believers is your love walk. Am I walking in love? Is love constraining me? Is love controlling me? Come on. Hallelujah. Well, I, I'm seeing a couple of head shakes, so you're, at least you're awake. Praise the Lord. So, our foundational scriptures here in Galatians chapter 5, which says in verse 6, faith works through love. The Passion Translation says it like this, all that matters now is living in the faith that is activated and brought to perfection by love. Now, faith is the hand that takes things from God that we need. Amen? Everything that Jesus purchased on the cross, we can receive through the hand of faith. Salvation, healing, deliverance. Amen? Prosperity. Jesus was made poor that we would be made rich. Then he took all of our sickness, all of our disease on the cross, at the cross, crucified it there, defeated it there. If I need healing in my body, it's faith that reaches out. It's the hand of faith that reaches out and appropriates that from my Heavenly Father. So everything Jesus purchased is available to me through faith, hallelujah, but faith works by love. So I've said this to you before and I'll say it to you again. When symptoms endeavor to attach themselves to my body, how many of you know I've passed up Maybe you have two wonderful opportunities to be sick. Come on. You get up in the morning and just, it's, oh, something's off. Right? And you just, oh, I gotta, the head is, the ears are, the eyes, the nose, the mouth. Something's not. 
You know, and you know, you could crawl into a hole and say, oh, 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 oh I'm going to go back to bed and I'm going to pull the covers all the way up. Or, or, or faith must have a corresponding action. I'm getting out of bed this morning. I'm going to go take a shower. And as I'm in the shower, I'm speaking the word of God. Hallelujah. By his stripes, I am healed. I am delivered. I am set free. My body functions perfectly. Sinuses function perfectly. Liver, kidneys. Come on, somebody. Amen. And almost without fail, I can point to dozens of times now, all the symptoms go swirling down the drain with the soapy water. And you go to work. How many of you know that sickness is a tough taskmaster? Huh? Sickness will keep you in bed. Sickness will cost you money. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. So, if symptoms endeavor to attach themselves to my body, and I am using faith to drive them off, but they seem to be stubborn, they don't seem to be leaving, the first thing that I check is my love one. Did somebody say something to me that I'm angry with them about? Did somebody do something to me that I haven't forgiven them for? Are you listening to me? Why? Faith works by love. Jesus said in Mark's gospel, when you pray, believe you receive, right? And then he says, when you're praying, forgive. Because if you're in unforgiveness, your prayers get hindered. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. So, is this important? Yes. Is it important that we learn how to walk in love? Aren't you half as excited as I am? Well, let me get you there. Hallelujah. Did you go to our, our golden scripture? We have a foundational scripture. Now we have a golden scripture. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 9, but concerning brotherly love. You and I have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. Who's teaching us to love one another? God. 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 Isn't that exciting? Yeah. God himself says, hey, listen, I'm going to teach you how to walk in love. I'm going to take you by the hand, and I'm going to teach you how to walk in love. Why? Well, here he says... Are you ready? We urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more. In what? Love. Love. So God has promised us to take us by the hand. He's going to teach us how to walk in love. Why? Because it is God's desire that we walk more and more in love. Not just more. Somebody say more is good. More is good. Okay, that was weak. More is good. Yeah, more and more is better. Right? We're at one level of love. Maybe we'll call it entry level, just for ehaws. But God says entry level is not good enough. I'm going to take you by the hand and I'm going to show you how to walk more and more in love Amen. so that you become just like me let me try this over here so that you become just like me, just like God walking in God's kind of love right and we see in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 what the God kind of love begins to look like love is patient <laughs> help me <laughs> love is kind <laughs> do we need to go any further? Yes. Apparently we do because, you see, we're starting to chuckle because we know we're not all that patient, are we? We're not all that kind, are we? Oh, and, and if, you're, if, if you're anything like anybody else on the planet, it's usually with those who are closest to you that you're the least patient with, that you're the least kind to. And I began taking a look at this, you know, as, as, as I study in these things and as I prepare in these things, not only will God give you examples, right, but he'll show you what you're doing in your current life. Hallelujah. 
where you're not walking in love, where you have an option. No, you have a directive now on the inside. If I'm going to do what Jesus said to do, in John's Gospel, in the 13th chapter, a new command I give you, that you're to love one another as I have loved you. Well, how did Jesus love them? Well, we've just gotten an illustrated sermon from Jesus. He took off all of his clothes. He stripped himself down to the waist, right? Got down on his hands and knees, got a bowl and a pitcher and a towel and washed all their feet, right? I'm going to take it a step further. I, I, do, I feel like preaching this morning and I'm, I'm endeavoring to hold back, right? You want to talk about the love of God? You want to talk about the love of God in action? Jesus Showing them by washing their feet, this is how you're to treat one another. You're to, this is how you're to revere one another. You're to look out for one another. But he takes it a step further. I'm going to go to the cross. You see, love takes the hit. Love steps in front of the speeding bullet. Love takes the punishment. Love says, whatever's coming down the pike towards you, I'm going to get in the way of it. And I'm going to allow it to hit me. Right? And when you take a look at Jesus on the cross, that's the love of God in action. That Jesus said, I'm willing to take the hit. I will, Father, I will take. Oh, you have to, listen, you have to get excited about this. I will take all of the punishment that is due them for sin. And while I'm on the cross and I'm suffering in this extreme, I'm going to say, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. Right? And I'm like, you know what, Lord? I'm going to take it even a, a step further. While, while he was in the garden, amen, we see that Jesus is beginning to sweat blood out through his pores. He has taken all the fear, all the anxiety, all the worry, all the panic, everything that can cause fear, panic, and anxiety. And he has said, I'm going to take the hit. For all of their fear. And he, it, it, listen, it's, it's actually a medical condition. You can have so much stress on your body that it will physically cause the capillaries beneath your skin to break down. And you'll begin to drip blood out of your pores. But typically it's just a little tiny pinprick of blood that's coming up through your pores. That's not what the Bible said. The Bible said he was sweating great drops of blood. Where were they coming from? Come on. They were coming from his head. His mind. Come on. And if that wasn't enough, they put a crown of thorns on his head. We all know this from reading our Bible. We all know this from studying the Bible. Where blood is shed, come on, sin is washed away. Anything that is not of faith, right, fear, is sin. All of our worry, all of our panic, all of our distress, Jesus took. And if that wasn't enough, that he took all of our sin, all of our sickness... All of our disease, he said, but here's the, really, here's the real problem with sin, dear Christian. Your sin and my sin separates us from God. Right? Adam's problem when he sinned in the garden was that he separated himself from the presence of God. And Adam recognized in a moment of time he would have to contend with the whole universe without God. You imagine the fear that must have come on Adam when he recognized, I have to contend with the whole universe and the devil and everything that is seen and unseen alone? It must have been devastating to be separated from God. How do we know it was devastating? Because Jesus said, okay, God, I'll go to hell. I'll be separated from you. For all of eternity, Jesus had never been separated from God. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. For all of eternity, all of infinity past, and all of eternity forward, Jesus had never been separated from God. So we hear him again on the cross. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Why? Because I'm about to be separated from you. And everything that I know, which is everything, that once someone goes to hell, they don't get out. Their spirit is trapped there forever. Satan is the Lord of death. And he has the keys to death, hell, and the grave. 
So what does Jesus do? He takes the hit. He says, I'll go to hell for them. Woo! We need to come to the other side. Now we need to come to the victory side. Because he was there for three days. Come on, somebody. And on the third day, God spoke. And the power of God descended into hell and took the three-day dead spirit of his son and brought it back to life. He became the firstborn amongst the brethren and stepped up out of his grave and walked through the ageless corridors of time and damnation itself and strolled into the throne room of Satan and knocked him off of his throne and stripped him of the power of death. Woo! Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He says in Revelation, I am he who was dead, but now I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys to death, hell, and the grave. And so the, the, the overarching, the overshadowing, the indescribable joy that belongs to a born-again believer is that Jesus tasted death for us so that we don't have to. So that we don't have to be afraid. Listen, why are people afraid to get on planes? They're afraid the plane's going to crash and they're going to die. <laughs> Why are people afraid of snakes? Because the snake is going to bite them and they're going to die. Why are people afraid of COVID? Because COVID's going to get on you and you're going to die. Well, number one, death has no grip on me. Well, God loves me that much that death has no hold on me. Are you listening to me? And if something happens to take me off the planet early, which it won't, you cannot threaten a Christian with thoughts of heaven. Amen. <laughs> oh, you're going to die and go to heaven. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so sounds good, doesn't it? That's right. This overwhelming fear of death. In the church, listen, never mind outside. We understand outside the church. Because they haven't been taught like you've been taught. But to threaten a Christian with thoughts of heaven. Oh, you're going to die and go to heaven. It's going to be terrible. No, it won't be terrible at all. I have angels right now building a mansion for me. And Jesus is the architect. Or didn't you read John's Gospel in the 14th chapter? In my Father's mansion, there are many places I go prepare a place for you. That's right. Hallelujah. Amen. So when Jesus goes to the cross and takes care of my sin, my sickness, and my disease, hallelujah. When he goes to the grave and he takes my place so that I'm never separated from God. That's right. Hallelujah. Oh, yeah, that's, that's, that's the love of God. That's agape. Yes. That is the white, hot, fervent, eternal, infinite, always giving love of God. Amen. Amen. Woo! Glory. Amen. God says, I will teach you how to walk in that level of love. But now listen, let me help you, dear Christian. It's going to cost you something. I said it's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you time. It's going to cost you resources. Ah, uh, that's why you have to be rich. That's why you have to have a lot of money, right? When the Lord says, listen, why don't you go buy lunch for everybody? Yeah, not has uh, Absolutely, let's go get that done. What? I'm walking in the love of God. I got the check. Let's go to lunch. Hello, somebody. A homeless person, I told you, we're, we're going to start doing this. We're going to get it together, right? We see these homeless people that are out, you know, at the, the different stores. Let's get them gift cards to the local restaurant. Here, go get a sandwich. Listen, it's, folks, it's all coming. And you all signed up for it. <laughs> right? You want to walk in the God kind of, well, I don't want to do that. Right? You have to crucify your flesh. 
Roll down your car window. You don't have to roll it down these days. You got to push the button and let the window come down. Hey, hey, listen, brother, just wanted to bless you. Amen. Hey, listen, sister, just want, just wanted to bless you. Amen. What's it going to cost you? Crucified flesh. Right. That's what it's going to cost. Right. Hey, listen to me. We, the ecclesia, the church, we here at Faith Bible Church, we are purposing to show the love of God in practical ways. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you for your enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus said in John 13, there is a new commandment that I give you, that you love each other as I have loved you. Now, we've been down this road before, but I think we need to go down it again. Jesus said this is a new suggestion. No, it's a new commandment. It's an order from the head of the church. He is the chief of staff. Right? Come on. We, he, he is the head. We are the body. Does the body carry out the orders of the head? Does your body carry out the orders of your head? Well, then we're supposed to carry out the orders of the head. So he said, this is a commandment. This is an order that you love each other the same way that I have shown you how to love. Amen. Sacrificially, crucifying your flesh. I don't know if Jesus was upset or not upset about having to get down on his hands and knees and washing people's feet. I'm, I, my assumption is, no, it's not my assumption. If Jesus is the love of God in action, then he was more than willing. Come on, somebody. He was more than willing. Amen? Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise God forever. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Woo. I wrote in here, this is a command, an order, a requirement, not a suggestion. If he is your Lord, then you do not get to choose not to do it. <laughs> Some of you have been in the military. I see you shaking your heads up and down. When the captain, the lieutenant, the colonel, when somebody gives you an order, do you sit around the barracks and have a group meeting as to whether you're going to carry the order out or not? Oh, I think the old man's off his rocker. We're not doing that today. You know what? I just don't feel like it. <laughs> they got ways of making you feel in the military. <laughs> KP, the brig, extra guard duty. Yes. Come on. Sometimes all, same and sometimes all the same weekend. Right? <laughs> Some of you are going, yep, I was a recipient of that on more than one occasion. <laughs> right? It's not a suggestion. You execute on this. We're not given an option. We must execute on this. We must execute the orders of the head of the church. And listen to me. It's not based on feelings. Whether you feel like doing it or not. No, no, no. You just do this. You carry this out. You crucify your flesh. Woo! We have fun now, aren't we? Hallelujah. Glory to God. Uh, listen, I heard for years preachers talking about, you know, the Lord will never ask you to do something you don't want to do. And I found that to be completely contrary to what it was I was experiencing. Now, you never teach experience as doctrine, right? But if you're going to grow up, like we were talking about earlier, then God sends you somewhere you may not want to go. You crucify your flesh and you go. Right? You know what? Yeah. Well, sir, are you sure about this? Is there somebody else up there I can get an opinion from? Uh, you know what I need? I need to fast and pray about this. Here's what I have found. When God gives me an instruction to do something, fasting and praying, you can fast and pray all live long day. You know what you're not going to do? You're not going to change God's mind. <laughs> and listen, this is where many Christians get stuck, so I want you to pay attention. This is where many of us get stuck. God gives us something to do. We choose not to do it because we don't accept it as an order or as a command. And then we can't figure out why things aren't working out or why we're not moving on or why we're not going any further. Or what's the next step? Listen to me. God will not give you the next step until you execute this one. 
Don't shout me down because I'm preaching so good. And I'm not talking about getting into the pulpit. I'm, I'm talking about your personal life and in your personal growth with God. Here's the thing that we're doing down here at Faith Boot Camp while we're on the military today. Did you know that this is Faith Boot Camp? Right? The earth. We are living in Faith Boot Camp. You don't need faith in heaven. Everything's taken care of. There's no devil up there. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And streets are made out of transparent gold. Woo! <laughs> right? But down here is faith boot camp. You have to use faith. You have to execute in faith. Come on, somebody. There's a devil down here that must be contended with. And I don't know about you. I'm not interested in just hanging on. So I'm not interested in just hanging on. I'm interested in going into debt into devil hell territory. I'm interested in going into the enemy's camp and beating him in his camp. Come on! Go and eyeball the eyeball and say, listen, the town of Wallingford does not belong to you. Amen. It belongs to Jesus of Nazareth and I have come to plant a flag. It's the crimson stained banner of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to stand there toe to toe. Because I didn't come to this fight fair. I'm bringing him. I'm bringing my heavenly father. And all of the angelic hosts. We're coming. And we're taking back what it is that you're. You are sitting on top of stolen lives. On stolen dreams. On stolen. Come on. You're, and I'm getting it all back. Amen. For Jesus. Woo! <laughs> Are you listening to me this morning? It's not a suggestion. We're going to be walking more and more in this level of love. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Mm, yeah. Praise the Lord. Yeah. We've seen that love prefers. We've seen that love covers. We've seen that love edifies. But what I've also seen is that our words are like arrows. Amen. That's what the Bible teaches us, and that our words can do a lot of damage. Amen. You had a child that grows up in a, in a house where they've been told that they're a bum or they're a loser or they're never going to amount to anything, or they're ugly, or they're fat, or they're short, or they're Italian, or they're Irish, or they're black, or they're white, or they're red, or they're yellow, or they're brown. Huh? Words are like arrows. And the Lord has been giving me a lot of illustrations about my words lately. And I ended up having to repent. I don't know about you, but my words can be sharp. And he is not dealing with me about it. He is giving me a commandment. It's not a suggestion. It's an order. Are you listening to me? And here's what he showed me. Words are like arrows. When that arrow gets on the string, is it causing any damage? Nope. When that string, I live my brother-in-law, was talking about my, my brother-in-law is a hunter, a bow hunter, crossbow, compound. Woo! Right? Come on, somebody. When you pull back on that string, that hurting anybody? No. no. It's when you release it. Hey, you just gotta let it go. And here's what he showed me. Right? Because I'm like, okay, so yeah, it let go, and it's going towards the target. And he said, son, it won't stop until it hits the target. Now, I don't know about how God does you. I know how he does me. I fell apart. Because I recognized that when my words come out of my mouth, they're going to hit the target. Am I talking to the right group of people? Yeah. Or are you all perfect in your words? Your words are going to hit the target. Now, it's so interesting to me that here I am talking with my brother-in-law, who's a hunter last night, and he is telling me about the effects of a compound bow on chickens. <laughs> you were there, yeah. right? And I started to chuckle, right, thinking about it, because, you know, my sister-in-law, I love her, but she loves chickens. 
And he's talking about shooting the chickens with a compound ball. <laughs> he said, well, here's the problem. <laughs> you don't just get one. He said, it'll go through that chicken, and it'll go through the next chicken, and it'll go through the next chicken. He said, I can kill all of them with one shot. <laughs> and the last one will be dead before the first one knew it got hit. Oh, now we were, we were talking about words or arrows. And he showed me. And your words go through that target and that target and that. And now you're hitting other people unintentionally. What am I doing? You caused injury to one and that one turns and causes injury to another. And that one turns and causes it. Come on, I'm preaching. And that turn. And it, so now you go out and you're hurt. And you know what you're going to do? You're going to find someone to hurt. Oh, and then that person's going to go out and they're going to find someone to hurt, they're, they're going to use their words. They're going to cut them down. Listen, if you're a guy, and see, this is it. No excuses. I came up the stairs yesterday. I turned to my wife. I said, there can be no excuses for me. Am I right? There can be no excuses. I cannot give myself an out. If my words go and injure, by the way, it's always those that are closest to you. If my words go and injure, then you're going to go out and you're going to injure. And then they're, they're going to go out and they're going to injure. And they're going to go out and they're going to injure. And if I believe the Bible, and I do, and I believe that I'm supposed to lead, then leaders lead. What does that mean? You take the hit, you lay down your life. You zip that bad one. Down to my knees in the office, Lord. The fruit of self-control. The fruit of love. The fruit of patience. You put all of them on the inside. Listen, he didn't leave us without hope. I hope you understand where I'm coming from. If you go on and read here in Galatians chapter 5, you'll see that after he says, stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made you free. <laughs> and after he says that you are to have your faith working by love, he says, oh, and so here's how you do all of this. There is fruit deposited on the inside of you by the Holy Spirit. The first of which is love. Patience. Kindness. Gentleness. Everything that a dude isn't. Right. Everything that society tells men not to be. But if I believe that Jesus is a true hero, Amen. then I must walk in the same... Come on, I'm talking to somebody this morning. I must walk in the same level of humility that Jesus walked in. Jesus said to Peter, after Peter struck off Malchus's ear... I can get 12 legions of angels to get me out of this mess. Right? Now, if you take a look at what a legion means, right? a, le a Roman legion typically has 6,000 in it. I can get 12 legions of angels to get me out of the... I can, they can come. I, I don't have to go to the cross. I, I don't have to do none of this stuff. They can get me out of this. But it is more beneficial for me to take the hit for you than it is for me to get out of it. And what did Jesus show us right there? Let me help you. He showed us you've got to be superior to power. Come on, somebody. And here in the earth, and here in modern society, you are told to be drunk with power. You use power to get your way. You use your power to kick tail. You use your power to threaten. You use, po you use power. You use power. And by the way, they're teaching it also into uh, uh, the women of this generation. Women power. Man power. Your power. Take back your power. Your power. Your, you must be, listen to me, superior to power. If we're going to be like Jesus, then we must do what Jesus did, humbled himself and became obedient even to the point of crucifixion. What happens when you're superior to power? Let me help you. Therefore, God highly exalted him and gave him a name that's above every name. If I want to grow in this thing, if you want to grow in this thing, if we want to grow in this thing called love, then we're going to have to walk in humility to get there. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory. Love does no harm is the title of this message. Love does no harm. 
We let our words fly in a moment of anger, frustration, and fear. And yeah, listen, we can repent after that. I understand. And and if you're if you're uh, doing it to a, if, you're, if you're using uh, words against a Christian or speaking to a, a spouse, right? Surely you can go to your spouse or you can go to your whatever, and you can say, "I, I apologize. Forgive me." And they're Christians, and they will. But listen to me. Listen to me. Just what I saw last night. The damage has been done. The thing here is to get control over this before it flies. And God is showing us through, aren't you excited about this? God is showing us you can do it. You can walk in this level of love because I'm saying they're going, Lord, how is this possible? Oh, well, here's where he started with me. No excuses. Listen, if, if you're, if you're, well, I have to use us, right? If I offend Cindy, right, and I come to her and say, sweetheart, I apologize. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that. She will forgive me. She, she will, right? But, but, but the damage is done. I've injured her. And what God is saying is, you don't have, you, if you give yourself no excuse, there is no excuse for your behavior. You must use the Word of God. You must use the Holy Spirit of God. You must use the fruit of the Spirit to control that pie hole under your nose. <laughs> then I'm not doing any damage to her. Are you listening to me? You're not doing any damage to a co-worker. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Love does no harm. We cannot allow anger, fear, or frustration to be an excuse. All we're doing is yielding to the flesh. We're yielding to the wrong spirit. This is where it gets demonic, folks. You go, what? This, this is where it gets evil. When you recognize that your words are causing that level of injury in somebody's life, we're yielding to Satan. We're yielding to the satanic nature. We're yielding to the flesh. We're allowing our flesh to run the show instead of our spirit to run the show. And I don't know about you, I don't want to be associated with him in any way, shape, or form. Amen. I've been translated out of his kingdom. And I've been translated into the kingdom of light. So I should no longer have fellowship with that kingdom. Amen. Right? And listen, I know some of you are going to wrestle with this. I didn't say it was going to happen overnight. Like I said, if you're like me, 30 years before you came into the kingdom, I had 30 years of the flesh running the show. But now I've been walking with the Lord for 25 years. Right? James just turned 25. It was 25 years ago I went into Teen Challenge. Right? That started my walk. Well, don't you think after 25 years I should have a better handle on some of this stuff? Oh, listen, don't look at me in that tone of voice. Shouldn't you? <laughs> right? I didn't say it was going to happen overnight. What I'm saying to you, I'm not even suggesting it to you. No excuses. Cindy will let me off the hook. She'll say, listen, sweetheart, it's okay. No, it is not okay. It is not okay. Come on, I'm using our relationship because I want you to bring it home. It's not okay. You say, well, I'm not married. Okay, so you're living with mom and dad. You're living in their house. And they ask you to bring your clothes down the stairs and put them in the laundry. I'm not doing that. A bunch of jerks making me do it. <laughs> they ask you to cut the lawn. Oh, I'll do it later. No, no, listen to me. No, somebody say it out loud. No excuses. Wow, that was weak. <laughs> no excuses. None. Zero. Let go out and shovel the snow. No, I'm sleeping. <laughs> I, I told my son, I said, my father never shoveled snow after I turned 16. Never. It's actually even earlier than that. It's after I turned 13. Right? But there was three of us. There was three boys. 
And we didn't, we didn't live in a big piece of property, right? It wasn't, you know, it wasn't. But here I am lying up in a bed on a Saturday morning, or, or, or worse still, a work day, and he's out shoveling before he goes to work. There's something wrong with that movie. I see a couple of you shaking your heads. So why are you lying in bed then on a Saturday when your father's out shoveling the driveway? Well, because he's got a snowblower. Yeah, be a blessing. Walk in love. Say, hey, listen, Pop, I made you a cup of tea. Why don't you sit down there at the table? I got the shoveling. Yeah. <laughs> you should see some of the looks I'm getting. <laughs> what? I don't even know how to make tea. And there begins the problem. <laughs> Never mind starting the snowblower. Listen, you got <laughs> and by the time you get through explaining everything, and I like my tea that none of them. Are you following me? I'm talking about walking in love, and that's just a practical way of walking in love. I remember turning to my younger brothers and saying, what good is it if we're up lying in bed and he has a heart attack out shoveling the snow? Right, because we had an object lesson in our neighborhood. I was young. I was maybe 10, no, I was a little bit older, 12 or 13 years old. I was out shoveling my front sidewalk, right? And our neighbor up the street who owned the local hardware store had gone out to start his snowblower because he had the local hardware store. So, of course, he has a snowblower. Mm -hmm. Miss, Mr. Landino was his name. <laughs> his wife, Mrs. Landino, they were off the boat from Italy. She would make this pizza. Oh. You walk by her house, you'd oh. right? we sit on her back porch, and she would bring us, it was the uh, the thick Neapolitan, yes. oh, <laughs> the fresh basil from the garden on top of it. Anyway, her husband, pulling a snowblower, has a heart attack and dies in the driveway, in the snow. Our other neighbor, Hallelujah, Frank Foley, was a lieutenant in the fire department in New Haven. And, and he, he was one of those men in my life. There was a couple of them, but he was one of those men in my life that shaped me as a younger man. Right? You always need, listen, listen, you fellas, you need another man in your life besides your father. Mm -hmm. Amen. Somebody with gray hair, with wisdom, biblical wisdom, to speak into your life. Right? And so, um, uh, somebody, they must have called the fire department when, of course, when Frank heard the sirens, he comes booking out of his front house. And, so I'm booking up the sidewalk with him, right? Because where Frank's well, I'm going. And we get to the end of the driveway. He stops, he turns around, and puts his hands on my shoulders and says, you're not going in there. And I said, why? He says, do you really want to see a dead body? And it kind of shook me. I was like, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> What's my point? He died. Starting a snowblower. You can thank me later, because you ain't shoveling this one. I shovel that one. Excellent. No, no, Excellent. Should I talk about lawn and mow lawn and you know, lawn? Move, move, move the fig trees in. <laughs> yeah, it is. The rock gets heavy, right? And they're twenty. They're all elastic. Yeah, they should be dragging it. <laughs> Dear Lord, glory to God. How do we get off on all that? Habit. Talk about walking in love. Love does no harm. When your hand, when your fingers are on the string, you still have control of those words. You do not have to loose them. Are you listening to me? You do not have to loose them. Praise God forever. Ha. If we're going to follow the love command, then we're going to have to get a hold of our mouth. Help me, Lord. We cannot allow anger, frustration, or fear to be an excuse. Somebody say it out loud. There is no excuse. We must walk in love. Amen? Hallelujah. You know, I didn't, I didn't mean it. I was upset. I got angry. I got hot. There's no excuse. Jesus said, you'll give an account for every idle word that you speak. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Listen, we talked about it. Yielding to the flesh. Yielding to Satan. That's the deeper revelation. Amen. I don't want to yield to him. I don't want to injure somebody with my words. There's no excuse for it. Amen. Hallelujah. Say it out loud. I will walk in love. That's weak. I will walk in love. I will walk in love. And God is teaching me 
How to do it. Hallelujah. Romans 13 says in verse 8, Oh, no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. There is, uh, and if there is any other commandment, they're all summed up in this saying, namely, you love your neighbor as yourself. And this is what started it. Verse 10, love does no harm. I didn't mean it. I just lost my temper. There's a lot going on. Does not give us the excuse to speak any way we choose. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. The Passion Translation says, Love makes it impossible to harm another person. New Living Translation says, Love does no wrong to others. Hallelujah. By the way, no, I won't even parenthetically insert, God will not lead you to hurt someone or to harm someone. Do I need to come out there and talk to you about that? God will not lead you to hurt someone or to harm someone. So this excuse of, well, God understands my heart. Yes, he understands what the Bible says, his holy written word, that the heart, the spirit, is wicked and deceitful above all things. <laughs> he does know your heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Lord knows my heart. Yes, it is wicked and deceitful above all things. Your spirit must be trained by the Word of God to act according to the Word of God. This, this is, this, I know this is deep, but this is important because we're using our feelings. And oh, yeah, well, the Lord understands me. I can say anything. I, he understands my heart. I didn't mean it. No, 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 no. No, no. What he understands is that your heart is wicked and deceitful. Your spirit is wicked and deceitful above all things. The human spirit must be born again. And after it gets born again, it must be trained. Somebody help me preach this this morning. It must be trained. To what? To fall in line with the word of God. How do you train your human spirit? You get your nose in that Bible. You find out. By the way, if you get your nose in the Bible, you begin to find out about how awesome God is. Mm -hmm. You begin to find out how much He loves you, and you begin to. It begins to dawn on you. It begins to. You know that. You know that phraseology begins to dawn on you. It begins to dawn on your spirit that God loves me so much and unconditionally that I can love so much unconditionally. I can look at. I can get. I, I can love unconditionally. That's right. Are you listening to me? That's right. The church walking in this level of love is now walking in the power of God. Why? Because God is love. I've said this to you before. I'm going to say it to you again. The education system tried to educate the hell out of me. <laughs> right? The Lord knows the police. Well, they tried to beat the hell. No, they, they, they tried to arrest the hell out of me. <laughs> And my parents, they, they tried to beat the hell out of me, right? But Jesus, he, he loved the hell out of me. Amen. Yeah. Hell was in my heart. That's where I was going. How about you? Right? And if I'm walking in the God kind of love, this place gets so filled with the power of God, which is love, that people in every manner of sickness, disease, bondage, I've seen folks come out of homosexuality. I've seen folks come out of lesbianism. Come on. Are you listening to me? God set them free. I said, God set them free. So how can a church then walk around with a sign that says God hates fags? You don't know who my heavenly father is. My heavenly father is love and the only thing that God hates is sin but he loves the sinner so much he sent his only son 
Did you see that in Romans? We haven't even gotten there yet. While we were still sinners. One translation says, while we were still far off, God sent his son. And Jesus came and took the hit. You know, you get, like I say, you get these, these illustrations. Uh, uh, you know, that we're in the middle of political season, aren't we? Right? And I, and I saw something the other day that I don't think I ever paid attention to. The Secret Service, who guards the President of the United States, do you know what their job is? They will step in front of the bullet. So our current President Donald Trump, do you think any of the Secret Service goes over to the White House on a regular basis and has dinner with them? Do you think any of them go to Camp David and hang out with them? No, they barely. Here's the ser here's the sermon. They barely know them. Their job is to protect them. What's it? Step in front of the bullet for someone they barely know. They know him walking down the hall. They know him when they open up the door and he gets into the car. Are you listening to him? Jesus? While you were still far off, said I will step in front of all of that. I'll take the hit. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. I'm talking about walking in the God kind of love. I'm talking about mindful of our words. Why? Because love does no harm. Did Jesus take the hit for you? Come on, somebody. Did Jesus take the hit for you? It's not a trick question. Yes, he did. Now go and do likewise. Go take the hit. <laughs> Woo! Put down your rocks and you get behind the pulpit. Hold on a minute. <laughs> it's going to cost us something. Amen? It should grieve us. It should grieve us when we injure people with our words. We shouldn't become so callous to it that we don't immediately, after we injure them with our words, apologize and get it right. But listen to me, the best thing is to see to it that we don't let them fly to begin with. That's right. Amen? Can you take two more? You can. Say, I can. I can. I understand that we can apologize. I do. And we should. And, you know, a Christian should forgive you. I understand that. But we should, hallelujah, should be able to control our tongue. Psalm 141, verse 3, says this. I think it's a great prayer. Would you like to pray this prayer? Would you like to pray this prayer? You ready? Lord, set a guard over my mouth. Keep a watch over the door of my lips. Don't let my heart be drawn to what is evil so that I take part in wicked deeds. Wouldn't that be a great prayer to pray before you got out of bed? Lord, I'm about to start the day. Set a guard over my mouth. <laughs> Keep a watch over my lips. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. The Passion Translation says it like this. He says, God, give me the grace to guard my lips from speaking what is wrong and guide me away from temptation and doing evil and save me from sinful habits. Now, I know in the culture, they don't like to talk about sin. I don't have that problem. Amen? If I call sin, sin, and you repent of it, and I repent of it, then my sin gets forgiven. It is not a weakness. Well, you know, my family's Italian, and we're just hot-tempered, and so we can... My family's Irish, and that's how we settle things. We just scream and yell at each other until somebody gets tired or somebody gets knocked out. <laughs> that ought not be. Not for Christians. Amen. Amen? Hallelujah. Help me, help me not to hurt people. Yeah, you're shaking your heads. Maybe we need to pray that too. Lord, help me. Not to hurt people. Forgive me where I've injured people with my words and my actions. Help me, Lord. Hallelujah. 
You see, as we grow in this and we learn more and more about our Heavenly Father, who He is, how He operates, His perfect love, taking the hits, causing no harms, it casts out all fear. The perfect love of God casts out all fear. And those other emotions that run our lives, that try to run our lives, fear, anger, worry, concern, whatever you want to call it, well, the perfect love of God drives all of that out of us. Right? Uh, are you shaking your head? Some of you are shaking your heads. The perfect love of God says no matter what's going on, you're not hearing me this morning. Somebody say, I'm listening. The perfect love of God drives out all fear. What do I mean? It, regardless of what's going on, God is working it out on my behalf. Hear me now, because here's the qualifier. Because I trust him. And so the question I'm going to leave you with this morning is this. Do you trust God? And do you trust him to work it out on your behalf? And if you do trust him, then the love of God drives out all fear. No matter what's going on, God is working it out on my behalf. And I'm going to land in a good place, a safe, ah, uh, his presence is rolling in here. A safe place. I'm in the middle of the perfect will of God, and I am his favorite child. I was talking with some of my board the other day. I came back to them because there's a lot of tumult going on, a lot of craziness in the earth, right? And, and I'm in business when I'm not here. And so we were talking about some of these things, and I turned to them and I said, fellas, I feel like a well-cared-for child. I know that no matter what happens, God will work it out for my good. I will land in a good place. It'll be a good place for me and Cindy and the kids. It'll be the best of places. Are you hearing me? Uh, this is faith talking. Amen? You need to engage your faith and start speaking these things out of your I understand there's crazy going on out there, but what are you speaking? Are you speaking all about the crazy? Or are you speaking that you're landing in a good place? And if you truly believe that faith works by love, and you do, somebody say, I do, I do. <laughs> right? Then you know that God is working it all out for your good, and you can trust him to get you to the right place at the right time with the right people. Amen? Amen. Stand your feet, everyone. Let me pray. Hallelujah.